At Columbia Biblical Seminary, our PhD program can be completed fully online with concentrations in Biblical Studies, Theological Studies, and Practical Theology. Full-time students can finish this program within three years, and our PhD program is competitively priced with other major programs in the United States and Europe. Columbia Biblical Seminary, solidly evangelical, great commission focused. Hi, I'm Dr. Croto, and we are embarking on a course on how to study the Bible. I'm excited about today because today I'm going to give you some very specific things you can do as you're interpreting Scripture. So today's lesson is on some general concepts for interpretation. Now, first of all, I want to read to you a verse that Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 2.15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Now, that word that's translated do your best means includes the idea of being extremely cautious, doing your best, being cautious, being careful. Paul acknowledges that when you're handling the word of truth, there is work involved and you need to be careful when you do it. And that's why we're having this class, because I want you to be careful and skilled in how to handle the Word of God. And the first concept I want to talk to you about today is the most important concept that I will say in all the time we're going to spend together in how to study the Bible, and that is this. Context is king. Context is king. Context is the most important concept in interpretation, and there is no way that that could be overstated. It is the most important thing. Context determines meaning. Think about that. It determines meaning. If I said to you, go for it, what do I mean? You don't know what I mean because there's no context to it. But if we're talking about a business that you want to start, and at the end of that conversation I say, I think you should go for it, then I'm saying start the business. But if we're talking about whether or not you should go back and do a master's degree at Columbia Biblical Seminary, and I say, go for it, then you know I'm saying go to seminary, not start a business. So the context actually determines what go for it means. It works with those kinds of phrases and sentences, but it also works with words. For example, if I said trunk, what do I mean by trunk? Well, you might say, well, the trunk can mean a lot of things. It can refer to a tree trunk, an elephant trunk, the trunk of a car, lots of different things that trunk can refer to. It can refer to like a big kind of like suitcase that you can pack things into, lots of meanings to trunk. And if I said it in a sentence, I put my daughter in a trunk, I'd be okay, well, he doesn't mean elephant's trunk. He could mean a tree trunk if it was kind of hollowed out. Hopefully he doesn't mean the trunk of his car because then we'll have to call the police on him, but he could mean to see, maybe let's see if she can fit in this trunk that I'm going to pack for the trip I'm going to go on. But you don't know until there's a context because context is what determines meaning. But there are different levels of context. For example, if we were going to talk about one of the most popular verses in the entire Bible, John 3, 16, what's the context? Well, the immediate context is the paragraph that's John 3, 16 to 21. And so when we're looking at the context, that's the immediate thing. That's the thing right around this passage. Usually it's marked off by paragraphs in your Bibles. But on a second level, it's the discourse. This is usually marked off in your Bibles by different headings that you'll see. And those headings aren't inspired and they're not perfect, but generally when you see headings, that's breaking up a discourse. And the discourse for John 3, 16 is John 3, 1 to 21. And so it's important to recognize when you're interpreting John 3, 16, that it takes place in this discourse. This is the discourse of the conversation with Jesus and Nicodemus. And it's important to realize that Jesus is having this conversation with Nicodemus. The conversation ends after verse 15 in John 3, 16 to 21 is, a ref is John reflecting upon that conversation. There's some more contextual information. On a third level, John 3.16 falls within the section of the Gospel of John that is in John 1.19 to 4.54. So what's happening in that section of Scripture? 
Well, in John 1, 19, it's, we have Jesus calling his disciples, gathering up his disciples for his ministry. In John 2, 1, we see Jesus turning water into wine at a wedding. At the end of John 2, we see Jesus clearing out this temple. Then in John 3 is the conversation with Jesus and Nicodemus where we find John 3, 16. The next passage is a dialogue, a debate, an argument really between John the Baptist's disciples and Jesus' disciples. Then in John 4, we have the woman at the well and the conversion of people in Samaria. And at the end of John 4, we have the healing of the royal official's son and the royal official's conversion. Now, all those stories might impact the way you understand John 3, 16 to 21. Because an author, when he's putting these stories together, he is selecting what stories he wants to tell. He doesn't always tell, he doesn't tell every story. John tells us at the end of his book, I am not giving you everything. There are too many stories to tell you everything. So the question is, why did he select the ones that he selected? And when he has a section like John 1, 19 to 454, you want you to think through that and say, do these stories connect to each other? Is there, is there a common thread between them? And then finally, the entire Gospel of John is context for John 3.16. There might be other places in the Gospel of John where the same concepts are being discussed, and that can also help you understand John 3.16. Now, in this figure about the different circles of context, you can see that the closer you are to the center, the more influence it has on the interpretation. So John 3.16 to 21 is more important than the entire Gospel of John, but these different levels of context need to be taken into consideration. So when someone talks about paying attention to the literary context, it's those, those circles of context that you need to be looking at. Secondly, let's talk about proof texting. I'm not sure if you've ever heard that, that term before, proof texting, but a lot of times it's used pejoratively. It's used in a negative sense. But really, proof texting can be both good and bad. So, bad. Proof texting is bad when you're citing or referencing a scripture verse or a passage without knowing the literary context. Never cite a verse unless you know the context. Because if you don't know the context, you, you might be citing it correctly, but you might not be. And you have no way to know if you don't know the context. But proof texting can be good when you cite or reference a scripture verse or a passage with knowledge of the literary context and you're using it appropriately, you're using it accurately. Let me give an example. Example one, a preacher states, everyone who believes in Jesus will have eternal life like it says in John 3.16. Now, this is proof texting John 3.16 correctly because that's what it says in John 3.16. He didn't take it out of context and that's appropriately what it means. Let's look, look at example number two. A boxer states, I know that God will help me be the greatest boxer ever because Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And that's bad proof texting. But why? Why is that bad proof texting? Well, let's take a look at the book of Philippians to see why this verse is being used incorrectly. Philippians is a book about rejoicing in persecution and suffering. And if there was one theme verse for Philippians, it'd be found in chapter 1, verses 27 to 29. Paul says this, only let your manner of life, here's the key phrase, be worthy of the gospel of Christ. That's kind of the key for, for phrase and verse in Philippians. Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents, this is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. And then verse 29, Paul says, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. You've been granted to suffer for the sake of Christ. So in this main theme verse in Philippians, Paul brings out this concept of suffering. 
You know, when we look at another book in the New Testament that's helpful for understanding Philippians, it's Acts. And Acts chapter 16 tells about Paul's ministry in Philippi. And it shows Paul was suffering when he was in Philippi. And that helps explain why he talks to them so much about suffering and rejoicing in the midst of suffering. Now, the next verse I want to bring out is Philippians 4.14. That says, Yet it was kind of you to share in my trouble. Again, he's bringing up this idea of suffering or persecution. At this point, when he's writing Philippians, he's in prison. Last time he was with them, he was beaten with rods and imprisoned. So again, this idea of suffering or trouble comes up. Philippians 4.11 says, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. All right, so why am I giving you all these verses from Philippians? Because Philippians is not about being able to do anything because Jesus will give you strength to do it. It's about, and this is what verse 11 is really clear about, in the midst of persecution, in the midst of suffering, you can be content, and it doesn't matter about the circumstances. So, I can be content in all circumstances even circumstances that include suffering, because Jesus can enable me to be content. So it's not about Jesus empowering me to knock someone out, to withstand a punch to my, my stomach or a punch to my face. It's about being content in all circumstances. So if the boxer really wants to use it appropriately, it would be whether I win or lose, I can be content in my situation because Christ can empower me to be content. So, regarding proof texting, make sure you always know the literary context for any verse you are citing. Third, let's talk about literary genre. What is literary genre? Well, the word genre means form or kind. And what we're, how we're using the word, it refers to a type of literature. Now, we encounter different literary genres in everyday life. Newspaper, a poem, a telephone book, a love letter, a menu at a restaurant, a math textbook, a devotional book, a map. These are all different types of literature, different types of genres. And just think about how we, we use these different types. For example, a newspaper. Not only is a newspaper a genre, but there are subgenres. There's the sports section, there's the front page news, there's the comics. And you interpret them differently. You don't read a telephone book the same way you read a love letter. Let's dig into this. Let's say I told you I was reading the newspaper last week and there was a story about a cat and the cat was talking to its owner about how much it loved lasagna. Now, as soon as I said the cat was talking, you probably went, what? You're reading this in a newspaper? Cats don't talk and they certainly don't love lasagna. So what are you talking about? But if I told you I was reading the comic section in the newspaper, then you're like, oh, because in the comic section, we suspend reality. That's one of the rules of the genre of comics. Anything can happen. There is nothing outside the realm of what is possible in a comic strip. Now, if I told you I was reading that on the front page of the newspaper, that either means the comic strip was really, really popular and for some reason they put it on the front page, or I'm going crazy, or the newspaper is nuts right? Because we know that, that that's not possible. Or take a look at a telephone book. Have you ever read a telephone book or known someone who read a telephone book and they open up and they start reading the names and the numbers and they start pouring over the names and numbers, just reading them over and over again with all this emotion and passion and care as they just read name after name, number after number that person would be crazy. But if I told you, instead of a telephone book, they were reading a love letter, you would say, well, that makes a lot of sense. Because we read love letters that way, we don't read telephone books that way. Just like these genres that we experience in our lives, the Bible contains different types of genres or forms of literature. In the Old Testament, the primary genres are narrative, law, poetry, prophecy, and wisdom. And we're going to have time throughout these eight weeks to talk about some of these genres and the rules we need to use in interpreting them. In the New Testament, 
we encounter the genre of gospel. Theological history, essentially Acts of the Apostles. Letters, and we, we see some prophetic literature and some apocalyptic literature. See, literary genre is like a game, complete with its own set of rules. And to understand what the biblical authors are saying, and what God, therefore, is saying through them, we must play by the rules of the genre they selected. You know, to go back to this whole idea of how we read things differently, a love letter versus a telephone book, you know, if, if you are looking at a menu and you place your order and the waiter comes over and says, can I, can I have your menu? And you're like, no, no, I, I just want to spend some more time pouring over the menu. We're going to think you're crazy. But my wife, for example, you know, we've had, she's had a lot of cell phones over, over her life, you know, back in the days when she had a flip phone and, and different versions of, of cell phones, now the smartphone. But previously, when you switched phones, there wasn't a really good way to get the text messages from one phone to the next. And there were text messages on there she wanted to save. Maybe nice things that I said or a friend said or a family member said. And so she has all the cell phones she's ever owned and their charging cables. And once in a while, she will charge them up, turn them on, and go and read through those text messages. And that makes sense because they, they have a lot of emotion involved in those text messages. But we don't do that with a menu. We don't do that with a telephone book. We don't read them the same way with the same rules that we would read nice text messages. Now, here's the trick. The trick with Scripture is that the genres, the types of literature we see in Scripture, are foreign to us. We are raised in a culture where we understand how to read a menu, we understand how to read the newspaper. It doesn't even have to say comics. If we just turn to the comic section and we see the way it's laid out on the page, we know the rules for interpretation. But the genres of Scripture are, are foreign to us. So, content. Content is important when we're looking at the genre of Scripture. And the context is the most important factor in interpretation. Context is the most important factor. Proof texting can be good or bad. And literary genre is extremely important. Well, let's go on to point three. And this is called the analogy of faith. The analogy of faith. Several aspects to this. First of all, the infallible rule of the interpretation of Scripture is the Scripture itself. And therefore, when there is a question about the true and full meaning of any Scripture, it must be searched and known by other places that speak more clearly. So we don't just look at a phrase or a verse or a passage in isolation. We want to look at other places in Scripture that speak to this. This is basically digging a little deeper into step four, correlation. So essentially what I'm saying is, is that Scripture interprets Scripture. We use other Scriptures to interpret Scriptures. We don't interpret them in isolation. There's diversity in the Bible, diversity in authors, diversity in languages, diversity in genres, but Scripture never contradicts Scripture. And that's why there's a unity, a beautiful unity in Scripture, and we can look at passages that are unclear and understand them by looking at clear passages. Let me say that again. We interpret the unclear passages by looking at clear passages. Now, some of this might sound a little subjective, like what's unclear to you might not be unclear to me. And that takes some time to kind of figure out what's unclear and what's clear. I, I've seen scholars take a clear passage and try to make it seem like it's unclear so they can kind of dismiss it. But there are passages in Scripture that are absolutely clear, and there are passages in Scripture that are absolutely unclear. And when they're unclear, we want to make sure we don't, we don't hang our doctrines on the unclear passages. Realize that there is only one correct interpretation for every passage, but there are many applications. One correct interpretation. So the, 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 the meaning of the passage is the meaning the author was trying to communicate to the original audience. And there's only one of those. But there are so many different ways to apply it. So once we get to step three in our process, where we have the underlying theological principle, and then we move to step five eventually, the application of that principle, you and I might apply it very, very differently because the Spirit can speak to us and convict us in different ways with the same theological principle. 
one correct interpretation, many applications. So I want to use a passage. This is going to be a little controversial, but that's okay. We can handle it. Um, a passage that is, I would say, is an unclear passage. And it's an example of how we should use clear passages to help us understand unclear passages. I'm not going to resolve all the issues involved with this passage. I just want to illustrate the idea of unclear versus clear. Hebrews 6. The question is, can Christians lose their salvations? Or can Christians forfeit their salvation? So Hebrews 6, let's read verses 4 through 6. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, it's impossible to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding Him up to contempt. So, question. Is this passage describing a situation where someone who is a Christian and then something happens and they're no longer a Christian? That's one of the questions people bring to this text. Another question. Is it describing people who are actually Christians or people who appear to be Christians? Now, the descriptions in this passage are extremely positive. It says that they were enlightened. That's a good thing. They tasted the heavenly gift. That sounds like a good thing. They were companions with the Holy Spirit. These are all good things that the author is saying about these people. What's interesting is the text never says explicitly that they're in fact Christian. Here's what I mean. Those phrases are not the typical phrases we see in the New Testament when an author is trying to say that someone is saved. So the author of Hebrews doesn't say they placed their faith in Christ and therefore were justified. He doesn't say they were made alive together with Christ. They were raised with Christ. They were seated with Christ. They were regenerated. They were saved even. He doesn't say these things. He seems to be circling around that concept using phrases and words and expressions that are indicating very positive things, but he never actually says that they're Christians. He said they were companions with the Holy Spirit. He doesn't say they were indwelled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not saying that I'm 100% confident that these people aren't Christians. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying there's a lack of clarity in what he's specifically describing. So if there's a lack of clarity about whether or not these people are actually Christian or not, and it seems like what he's saying is, on a superficial reading of the passage, even beyond a superficial reading, you could easily see this and say, well, there's a chance that you can be saved and then later on not be saved. But there's a lack of clarity. So we want to compare the unclear passages to the clearer passages. In other words, we allow the explicit to interpret the implicit. So here's a couple verses that I want to read to you and talk to you about that I think are a lot clearer than Hebrews 6. 1 John 6, 39. And this is the will of him who sent me. Now, Jesus is talking, and he says, the will of him, that's God, who sent me, that's Jesus. So here is God's will for Jesus, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, and that's God. So Jesus should lose none that God has given him, but raise it up on the last day. Here's the logic of that verse. God the Father has given Jesus certain ones. And if, if those are given to Jesus and Jesus loses them, he is out of the will of God. That's a pretty clear verse. It's not really that ambiguous. The terms aren't that ambiguous. Another one is John 10, 28 and 29. Jesus says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And in the Greek there, it means like never, ever. There is no possible way they will perish. So once he gives them eternal life, there's no chance of perishing. And no one, he says, will snatch them out of my hand. So they are in Jesus' hand. And once they are there, they can't be taken out. No one will snatch them out. Then he goes beyond that and he says, My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. 
So that means that there's no person that can come and pull someone out of the hand and, and rob them of eternal life because they will never, ever, in no way possible perish. That means Satan can't. That means people can't. No one can snatch them out of Jesus' hand and no one can snatch them out of the Father's hand. Another example. Last one. 1 John 2.19. It's kind of a tongue twister of a verse, but here's what John says. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. Here's what John is saying. There are a group of people that were a part of the church that John is talking about, the us. And there were a group of people and it seemed like they were of us. They seemed like they were Christians, but they left. They left the church, they left the faith, and they went somewhere else. Now, if they were truly Christians, John is saying, then they would have come back. They would have continued with us, they would have come back, and they would have continued in the faith. But they went out and never returned, which made it, made it really clear that in the first place, they were never saved. So, you can't have people then who appear to be Christians, walk away from the faith, and then that's how you know they were never really saved in the first place. So these are some general concepts for interpreting Scripture. So remember this last one here is the idea of Scripture interpreting Scripture and the idea that you want to let the clear passage passages interpret the unclear. Now, I'm not going to go through and give you the four major schools of thoughts for understanding Hebrews chapter 6 and then dig in to say what Hebrews chapter 6 actually means. That's not my point. My point was just to illustrate unclear passages. You want to, you want to read them through clear passages. If all I had for the entire New Testament was just the book of Hebrews, I wouldn't be really sure what to do with Hebrews 6 and some of the other warning passages in Hebrews. It would look like People can lose their salvation. But because I have access to other passages that are more clear, I use those other passages to help refine my understanding of passages that are unclear, like Hebrews chapter 6. Columbia Biblical Seminary offers 18-month online degrees designed to equip you to be effective in ministry. The Master of Arts in Bible Exposition will prepare you to communicate truths from God's Word effectively. The Master of Arts in Chaplaincy will prepare you for sports, corporate, and police chaplaincy. The Master of Arts in Ministry Studies will equip you for local and parachurch ministry, and the Master of Arts in Youth Ministry Leadership will train you to be a leader in ministries directed at youth. Columbia Biblical Seminary, solidly evangelical, great commission focused.